G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. We are in the midst of the trade period and usually I've been doing trade updates every single day uh, to talk about, or at least this was my intention, to talk about what had happened on that given day and so little happened on day two. So, so I'll probably return to my usual format of daily wraps, but uh, today there just wasn't a whole lot going on. So I'm going to take the opportunity to deep dive a little bit further the Dan Houston situation because this is probably becoming the more intriguing or the most intriguing trade narrative at the moment um, where there's some genuine doubt about is he leaving? And if so, which of these three to five clubs is he ending up with? I'm not saying it's necessarily the biggest trade because, you know, there's the Bailey Smith one, I think, is going to be a big deal over time. However, there's just so much intrigue and unknown about this Dan Houston situation. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about it today. So as it currently stands, we've got three primary contenders, it seems. Well, perhaps two absolute primary and then a bit of a dark horse in North Melbourne. And then there's some other teams below. So we're talking Collingwood and Carlton really being discussed, at least in the media, as the two primary candidates going for him. Now, is that accurate? I don't really know. I don't have any insight. I'm not a news breaker. However, just following the flow of media, Collingwood and Carlton are the two clubs that are constantly associated with him. And then North Melbourne as well, like I said, a bit of a dark horse because they are offering the most in terms of draft collateral. So they might be able to tempt Port Adelaide, but can they tempt Dan Houston? That's another question. We also know the Bulldogs and St Kilda have been linked to him in the past. And that's, I don't know if that's technically dead, but in today's video, I really wanted to deep dive those first three teams I talked about, unpack how they might get this deal done. And also some of the motivations and where they're at individually as clubs and how a trade might look and affect them. So let's start with a little bit of background. We know that Dan Houston um, apparently wants to get back to Victoria, despite the fact that he verbally committed to Port Adelaide a few weeks back. Um, it seems like he's pretty open to it. Now he's not banging home the, the banging the door down, whatever. He's not banging home the door down. Um, he is keen to get back to Victoria. He acknowledges he's contracted and, uh, you know, presumably wants Port Adelaide to be compensated. He wants a deal to work for all parties, but he's not demanding out of the club. So the reason I uh, point that out is it is entirely possible that Dan Houston stays at Port Adelaide. However, we also acknowledge generally in this situation, most times, maybe 75%. The club does negotiate a deal and gets it done. But I really don't know how likely that is here. And we'll get into all of that. So a lot of the talk is around how Gold Coast pick 13 is going to prove central to this negotiation for Collingwood and Carlton. North Melbourne are offering their future first to get Dan Houston. And you'd imagine that on itself would be enough to satisfy Port Adelaide. I'm sure given the strength of this draft, Port Adelaide would prefer a first round pick in this year's draft. But... Given North Melbourne's, you know, finishes over the last five years, they can assume it's a top five pick. It's possible it could be top two. I'm not necessarily saying it will be, but it is distinctly possible that it could be a top two pick. So for Collingwood and Carlton, they need to be able to get a deal done for Dan Houston, need to prize pick 13 from the Gold Coast Suns. Now, Collingwood don't hold a first round pick in this year's draft at all. And Carlton have one, but are unwilling to trade it because they rate the draft crop in this year's draft. They've got a couple of father sons that will land probably second and third rounds at this point. It's a little unclear, but their first round pick, they are unwilling to trade, which has reportedly pissed Port Adelaide off. However, if they can get a deal done for pick 13, there are a chance of Port Adelaide accepting it as part of a deal for Dan Houston. I want to make that clear. I really just don't think in any world Port Adelaide is saying, yeah, pick 13 for a contracted dual All-Australian. That'll do. There's going to be some more added on to that for sure. Gold Coast, as we know, have a first round draft pick this year in Leonardo Lombard, who will be a Academy match bid. So pick 13, it'll get absorbed. So they're, they're looking actively to trade it. And uh, we know as well for context, um, they've sort of alluded to the possibility that because they're already dealing with Collingwood for John Noble, that might nudge Collingwood in front because... I've got a quote here, actually. Craig Cameron says, we're keen to deal with the clubs we're trying to get some players from. That would be our first preference. So it doesn't rule out Carlton, but it does probably nudge Collingwood a little bit ahead because we know they're going to be dealing for John Noble. So let's unpack them team by team. Let's start with North Melbourne. They're, they're considered the third team back in this race, um, you know, presumably because... Dan Houston probably wants to play for a big Melbourne club that gets big crowds, plays at the MCG, and is a chance to play in finals next year. With all due respect to North Melbourne, you can understand why they're a little bit further back if that is a consideration for him. However, they do have the best deal on the table for Port Adelaide. So like I said, what could happen? North Avenue here, and I've said this before, but North Avenue here could be Port Adelaide say, nah, stuff ya, to Carlton and Collingwood because they can't step up satisfactory deals for Houston. And they'll say, hey, Dan, 
we can do a deal with North Melbourne that we really like this year and you can get back to Victoria. And Dan may be willing to go this year to get to North Melbourne rather than wait a year or two to get to the other clubs. So that is why they're still absolutely a contender. And you can see the motivations for North Melbourne are clear. They've been hitting the draft for so many years. Um, they're still going to hold pick two, which they might split this year, but they're still going to have access in this year's draft. And they're, therefore, their 2025 first rounder is decreasingly valuable to them. Whereas what they get in Dan Houston, is not only a dual All-Australian quality player, a mature player, shows some on-field leadership. It would also just really symbolize some outside external belief in the system and the regime at North Melbourne and the belief in their build as a club. And I can't help but feel it would possibly be a bit of a domino effect if Dan Houston shows some faith, joins Clarko at North Melbourne, North Melbourne improved this year, that could lead to, down the track, more players being open to moving to North Melbourne. So I can see the motivations for North Melbourne it's really clear. Let's move to Collingwood now. What are their motivations for getting Dan Houston? Well, they're in the premiership window and have a lot of players that could retire over the next two years. So they'd be looking to preserve the premiership window by getting an absolute gun in. On the other hand, it's worth mentioning they've just recruited Harry Perryman. Perryman is a half-back, or has been playing half-back for the Giants, bit of wing, a little bit of midfield. I know Collingwood have talked about Perryman playing a bit of midfield as well to support Nick Dacos but he is not quite a full-time midfielder yet. He would have to evolve as a player to do that. So in theory, Houston and Perryman are not dissimilar players, but you get them both. Could they work in tandem? Could they rotate through the midfield taking turns? It's a little bit tricky to see how that exactly works. However, you can understand Collingwood's motivation to preserve their window and bring in a 27-year-old, I believe, while over the next two years, I mean, how many players over 30 do they have? They got... Pendlebury is going to be 37 by round one. Side bottom, I think he's going to be 34. Jeremy Howe's around that range. Um, Jamie Elliott's around that range. Wiskin, Will, Wiskin Hoth, Will Hoskin Elliott, uh, I think will be 32 next September as I looked it up. So there's a bit of an age cliff here for Collingwood. I realize that they're getting some uh, commentary at least from, I think Matthew Lloyd said this, responding to Craig McRae's comments about, um, you know, preferring players, established players over draft picks where they're at, at the moment. And Lloyd, you know, I don't think disrespectfully just said, well, there's a real risk to that because if you continually invest in the now, you sacrifice the future quite significantly. That's not an invalid take. Colin would probably do need to consider young talent coming through the door. Bearing in mind, they do have Nick Dacos, one of the best young players in the comp, if not the best under 22 or whatever he is, probably is. They do also have a future father-son coming into the team as well. So in this specific deal, trading the future first with Gold Coast to get Dan Houston over the line, they're still not going to lose access to Tom McGuan. There are other levers they can pull to make that happen. So they, that is not a real concern in this particular deal. It's also worth noting Collingwood stayed relevant for a long time. But if you look at their decade of draft picks between like, I don't know, 2011 to 2020, I'm not too sure. There is a huge absence of draft hits there. So, so they got Dacos in 21. They got Dugowie with the top five pick. But other than that, a lot of their early draft picks have been busts and they still remain competitive. So there's a million different ways to skin a cat. Or maybe there's just a handful, I don't know. Never actually skinned a cat. That sounds awful. But when you look at, say, Geelong and Hawthorne at the moment, two teams that took part in finals this year, maybe they're outliers, but they are two teams that have stayed relevant or at least rebounded up the ladder without really a lot of access to top draft picks here. So I guess my point there is, can Collingwood keep treading water and stay perpetually competitive? Maybe not perpetually really in the hunt for finals and premierships, but if Geelong can do it, maybe Collingwood can do it as well. Anyway, that's just a bit of a side note as to the motivations for Collingwood here getting a 27-year-old gun player. They're also losing John Noble, and Dan Houston is a clear upgrade on John Noble as well. So what does a deal look like for Collingwood? Well, what is being reported is potentially if they get this pick 13 for a future first from the Gold Coast Suns, I don't know if that's going to be juicy enough on its own, but let's say it's pick 13. They package pick 13 and 23 in a strengthened deal for Dan Houston, which apparently would exceed what Carlton can do. And we will get to Carlton. The problem with this is, the problem with this is, if I'm Port Adelaide, I still don't accept that. You also factor in Joe Richards, but Joe Richards is you know, played nine games. So is Port Adelaide really going to be that amenable to a deal in that scenario of 13, 23 and Joe Richards for Dan Houston? I don't know. So Collywood could be in the scenario here where they could trade for Gold Coast pick 13. You'd think they'd probably want Port Adelaide to verbally say, hey, if you can get pick 13, we can make this work. On the other hand, I suppose if they don't, they still hold pick 13 in a strong draft. So maybe they're okay either way, but I'm a little bit unconvinced at this stage at 13 and 23 plus Joe Richards, 
it is really that tempting for Port Adelaide. I suppose it is a strong draft and I could be wrong, but that is my honest opinion at this point. So let's talk about Carlton. They're a little bit more of an intriguing one as to why they're going for Dan Houston so hard. As I said earlier, they're unwilling to trade their current first, so they'd need to trade their future first to Gold Coast to get pick 13, and that might have a, a bit of pick swapping around the place as well. I'm not too sure why Carlton appeared to be moving heaven and earth to get Dan Houston. Now, why do I say that? This is a little bit of a leap, but we know that they've told Matthew Owies, who had a career best season and kicked 33 goals and had a pretty good year to explore his options. Same thing with Matt Kennedy, who, who may have come into that exit interview and said, hey, I want more midfield time. And they said, no, maybe look around. Lewis Young is, is decent depth as a key back. And we know this time of year, there's actually a bit more of a premium placed on those players, but Carlton have said, look around. So I guess what I'm saying is, it's kind of almost implies that they're moving on these players to make room for Dan Houston. I realize that's an assumption that may not actually be true. It could be that they simply are unwilling to pay always what he's asking for. I think I read earlier today that he was asking for about seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars a year. And if that's the case, I can understand why Carlton probably balked at that. Equally with Matt Kennedy, if Kennedy's demanding more midfield time and they can't give it to him, maybe that's the reason he's moving. And I'm not sure about Lewis Young. However, if it is the case that they're moving on these three players to make room for Dan Houston, then I would agree with what Sam McClure said for once. That's it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for them to be going for a gun rebounding defender when, okay, maybe he's better than Adam Saad, but it's still not a huge positional need for them. And I would argue that, you know, if it costs them a few role players, that actually might have its own downsides as well, considering that always was pretty important to them this year. So I am undecided about this. I'm going to be completely open. I, I don't really know what Carlton's motivations here are. Are they moving heaven and earth to get Dan Houston or does it just appear to be that way? They're unwilling to trade their first round pick that they've currently got and people are saying, well, what is it? Do you want Dan Houston or do you not? Well, maybe they do kind of want Dan Houston, but probably prioritize the draft a little bit more. Maybe they're not moving heaven and earth to get him. But if they are, it's weird. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So like I sort of outlined with Collingwood here, Carlton faced the same thing where if they get Gold Coast pick 13 by trading their future first. That's still not a great offer for Port Adelaide and Dan Houston. Is that really going to be enough for Port Adelaide to say, yes, you can have Dan Houston, considering Carlton can't package that with a future first round pick because that now belongs to Gold Coast. So 13 on its own doesn't make sense. Now you could say, what if they get something decent for Owies and Kennedy? They might, they might, but it's still not going to be a lot considering they have told these players to look around. So I guess to summarize that point, pick 13 is not a really strong offer. Again, it would rely on Port Adelaide saying, hey, if you get pick 13, we're open to it. But I don't think Port Adelaide should be operating that way. I don't think that is a good offer for a dual Australian. I want to make it clear as well. I do respect and understand Carlton's desire to stay in this draft. When you look through it, since 2019, if I'm not mistaken, they've only drafted Ollie Hollands in the first round. Other than that, they have been absent from the first rounds of drafts. Is there a potential scenario here where they still go for pick 13, get pick 13 from Gold Coast, and then just take 12 and 13 and don't deal with Port Adelaide for Houston? What they've done in that scenario has made it impossible for Collingwood to get him, but he could go to North Melbourne still. So from that point of view, Carlton going for pick 13, they can't really lose, to be honest. Um, but again, I, I go back to what happens with Kennedy, Young and Owies. I think that will be telling. If Carlton, who probably are further back than Collingwood as it currently stands to get Dan Houston, if they fail to get Dan Houston, I'll be very intrigued to see what happens with Matt Kennedy, Lewis Young and Owies, because if they get re-signed, and that will kind of allude to the fact that they were making way for Dan Houston. Maybe they still get traded and they accumulate some points to match the Camprioli twins. It's an interesting one here. Like I said, I understand why Carlton's are going hard for the draft. I'm less sure why they are making a big play for someone like a Dan Houston. But anyway, guys, that is just my take on the scenario. If you're asking me to make a prediction, I didn't even plan this. Where do I predict he ends up? I think if he leaves Port Adelaide, it's probably going to be Collingwood at this current point in time. I am still a little bit iffy around that offer being enough for Port Adelaide. I'm skeptical that Port Adelaide would accept that, and I think it would be a bad move for them too. So I think it is still distinctly possible that Dan Houston stays at Port Adelaide unless he's willing to go to North Melbourne this year, which I have no insight as to that happening. Um, again, with this pick 13 from Gold Coast, I suppose Collingwood would still also 
find that really valuable just to hold in this year's draft for all the reasons we said missing out on talents accessing the top end talent of this year's draft considering they're getting McGuan and new eight all makes sense so anyway that was me just sort of spewing some thoughts around this dan houston thing it's a very intriguing situation so let me know in the comments what you think guys regardless who you go for and i'll see you in the next one cheers